Once again, I do want to greet you in the name of our triune God. As I continue to pray that grace and peace would be multiplied to you in the knowledge of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit and to the glory of God the Father. Let me invite you to turn in your Bibles with me to the 16th chapter of the book of 2 Samuel. It has been a very long time since we were in the books of Samuel, but my, my plan, my eager expectation is that from today forward, we're just going to keep going with Samuel. I love these books. I, I hate the delays that we've had, as necessary as they've been, and uh, I am very excited to get back to them. Now, I'm sure you remember that the theme of the books of Samuel is rejoice, the Lord is king. And just by way of introduction, just to remind you where we are in these books, uh, these books are ultimately about the search for the Messiah, for this long-awaited fulfillment of God's promise to one day send a king, a king who would really rule over his people. You know, as you read through the pages of the Old Testament, there, there does seem to be this expectation that while Yahweh is the true king of his people, that, that someday he will send a man, a real man, who will exercise kingship on his behalf, who, who will show his people how they are to live, who, who, like a shepherd, will lovingly and graciously and compassionately lead his people who had wandered so far away, lead his people back to God. And the big story of the books of Samuel is the story of Israel's search for that kind of a king. Now, for quite some time, as the readers of 1 and 2 Samuel, we really thought that David might be that kind of a king. But the events that have unfolded in 2 Samuel have thoroughly disabused us of that notion. Because as, as great as David was, and, and David was truly great, what we've learned in our study of 2 Samuel is that he's still not the king that we need. And the reason he's not the king that we need is because he's not Jesus. We'll have to wait a thousand years to get to that real king. But the events of 2 Samuel 11 and following have made that reality painfully clear to us. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, David took another man's wife, a woman by the name of Bathsheba. Bathsheba was the granddaughter of David's closest advisor, a man named Ahithophel. That will become very important soon. And then also in 2 Samuel 11, being unable to cover up his transgression with Bathsheba, he went ahead and just had her husband murdered. And then took her as his wife and hoped that nobody did the math, realizing that that baby was born a little bit premature. Well, then you get to chapter 12, and that's where Nathan, the prophet, confronts David with his sin, and, and Nathan pronounces a terrible judgment upon David. In fact, turn back to 2 Samuel 12. It'll help if you see it with your own eyes as we continue to, to see what happens in David's life. But in 2 Samuel chapter 12, you probably remember the story. Nathan has told David a story to try and to, to reach his conscience over what he's done. And then in verses 5 and 6, it says, Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, the man that this story was about. And he said to Nathan, As Yahweh lives, the man who has done this deserves to die, and he shall restore the lamb. Here's the key part fourfold. Because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And then verse 7, one of the most dramatic verses in the whole Old Testament. Nathan said to David, you are the man. And then you fast forward to verse 9 and here is this terrible judgment. Why? Why have you despised the word of Yahweh to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Anamites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me 
and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. And the first part of this judgment on David is that the sword will not depart from his house. Earlier, David said, this man deserves to pay fourfold for what he's done. Well, in time, it would be four of David's sons who would die as a result of what he had done. The baby that Bathsheba was carrying dies in chapter 12. Amnon, the heir to the throne, is murdered by Absalom, David's other son, in chapter 13. Absalom will die in chapter 18. And Adonijah will die in 1 Kings 2. David will pay fourfold for what he's done. But that's not all. Keep looking. Verse 12, or verse 11. Now thus says Yahweh, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the Son. And some of the sweetest words in the whole of the Old Testament are in verse 13. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. No excuse, no explanation, just total ownership. I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord has put away your sin and you shall not die. What a compassionate and gracious God we have. A God who could forgive sins, even as heinous as all of that. It's, it almost seems unfair that God would be that kind. And yet he is. And yet, the fact that David repented and that God forgave did not change the fact that David would pay dearly for what he had done. Alec Macher, commentator, said it like this. Repentance is like fetching back a stone one has just thrown into a pool. The stone can be retrieved, but the ripples go on spreading. David has repented. He has been forgiven. He shall not die. But the ripples of his actions will continue to spread out throughout the book. We begin to see their spread in chapter 13. When David's son, Amnon, again, the, the heir to the throne, rapes David's daughter, Tamar. And while David is upset about what happened to Tamar, he refuses to do anything about it. He, he essentially just says, I, I can't deal with this, and then doesn't. He acts like nothing's happened, and Amnon just goes on living his life. Eventually, Tamar's brother, Absalom, decides, well, if dad's not going to do anything about it, then I'll do something about it and ends up murdering Amnon for what he did to his sister and then fleeing to the north to his grandfather's kingdom. That's in chapter 13. And then in chapter 14, David somewhat reluctantly brings Absalom back, but still refuses to actually deal with the situation. He kind of ghosts Absalom. Ultimately, the chapter ends up with David granting something of a, a half-hearted pardon, kind of a, a quasi-reconciliation, but it's not right. It's not what it's supposed to be spoken. An incredible politician. Absalom wins over the hearts of the people of Israel, including the armed forces. He incites a rebellion against David and ultimately drives David out of the capital city, out of the city of Jerusalem. And that's where we finished last time in our study of 2 Samuel. The last time that we saw David, he was cresting the Mount of Olives, fleeing to the east, knowing not where he went, 
in a desperate attempt to escape from his own son, who was at that very moment riding into Jerusalem, into the capital city, having successfully captured the throne. And all of that brings us to 2 Samuel chapter 16, where if you can believe it, things just keep getting worse. As the ripples of David's sin continue to spread out, David finds himself on the run and in the presence of his enemies. But again, just by way of introduction, friends, do not miss the fact that all of this has come upon David as a result of his sin in chapter 12. And you know, that should scare us to death. It, it reminds us that, that while sin is, it is attractive and enticing in the moment, it comes at a terrible cost. Sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. That's what David is learning as the ripples of his sin continue to spread out. This is the story of David paying the terrible price for his sins. So, now that we're up to speed, Let's just jump right into the text with the first of David's enemies, a man named Ziba. Ziba is the one who has come to take. You might remember Ziba from previous chapters. He was Saul's servant, and David had placed him in charge of Saul's estate, um, kind of working underneath Mephibosheth, Saul's grandson. So that's who Ziba is. As we meet him in chapter 16, he is the one who has come to take. You know, friends, there are some people in this world who will do anything and say anything to get what they want, to get ahead. Ziba is that kind of person. And that's true today, and, and that, that's always been true. There are some people who will do anything and say anything to get what they want. Back in 2020, in the wake of the George Floyd event, uh, the Black Lives Matter group, it was flooded with millions of dollars in donations to help their cause, much of which was taken by movement leaders to enrich themselves, as it turns out, and to fund their own lavish lifestyles. One leader was accused of embezzling more than $10 million. We hear those kinds of stories all the time. But again, it's, it's, it has always been the case that there are just some people who will do anything or say anything to get what they want. You might have heard of the terrible winter of 1777, 1778, where the Continental Army uh, under George Washington was held up at Valley Forge and they nearly froze to death and starved to death at the same time. Their clothes were so threadbare, their blankets were so rare that many of the men would sit up all night long because they knew if they laid down to go to sleep, they would freeze to death and die. And like I said, they're starving to death at the same time. But what is less commonly known is that those conditions were not due to a lack of supplies. There was plenty of food, blankets and clothing available on the market. The problem was that the farmers wanted a bigger profit than the fledgling U.S. government could provide, so they said, sold all of their food to the British. And merchants refused to sell their wares at less than 1,000 to 1,800% profit, which the British were willing and able to pay. Some people will say anything or do anything to get what they want in this world. And, and that's Ziba. That, that is the man that we're about to meet in verse 1. It says, When David had passed a little beyond the summit, 
Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, met him. And just to give you a sense of, of how this all went down. So David gets the word Absalom is coming and, and just gathers his household and they flee. This highlighted yellow area, that's the city of David. That's what Jerusalem was at the time. They hike through the Kidron Valley there. They make their way up and over the Mount of Olives. That's where Nob is at the top. That, that's where we left David at the end of chapter 15. They gets up and over the Mount of Olives there. Ziba must have heard what was happening. And Ziba lives in Gibeah here. And so Ziba quickly assembles some things together and he too starts heading down towards Jerusalem and then up and over the Mount of Olives where he ultimately meets up with David. Here's another view of it as they kind of come together right there at the crest at the pinnacle of the Mount of Olives. It says, he came and met him with a couple of donkeys saddled, bearing 200 loaves of bread, 100 bunches of raisins, 100 summer fruits, and a skin of wine. Again, David left with no supplies. And so Ziba comes, whoops, Ziba comes with, it, how did the ESV take this? It said, with a couple of donkeys. It's probably better translated a string of donkeys because a couple of donkeys couldn't carry all of that. So there's, a, there's probably a string of donkeys behind him and they're carrying the, the food stuff that you would need on saddlebags, probably saddlebags very similar to these kinds of saddlebags. So they bring bread. Now these aren't lo loaves of wonder bread. It's more uh, like these pita breads here and various summer fruits, just anything to help this family, this, this large family uh, keep going through the wilderness journey that they were going to have to take. This is a um, saddlebags for wine that he would have carried with him as well. I think it might have, yeah, because this is where they're going here on this desperate attempt to escape. So then in verses two and four, two through four, and the king said to Ziba, why have you brought these? Or more literally out of the Hebrew text, he says like, what are these? Because Ziba is Mephibosheth's servant. Ziba doesn't own all of this. Mephibosheth owns all of this. So in the Hebrew text, it's a little more of, or, what, what are all of these? Ziba answered, the donkeys are for the king's household to ride on, the bread and summer fruit for the young men to eat, and the wine for those who faint in the wilderness. And the king said, and where is your master's son? Where's, where's Mephibosheth, the, the one who owns all of these things? And this is Ziba's moment. Ziba said to the king, behold, he remains in Jerusalem. For he said, today, the house of Israel will give me back the kingdom of my father. Oh, betrayal, betrayal. Then the king said to Ziba, behold, all that belonged to Mephibosheth is now yours. And Ziba said, I pay homage. Let me ever find favor in your sight, my lord, the king. What's, what's happening here? Ziba's lie, when you really take a moment to think about it, it's a pretty unbelievable lie. That Mephibosheth would believe that the house of Israel would give back the kingdom to Saul and his progeny, it's, it's totally unreal. It's a Absalom is coming in. Absalom is a son of David. Um, it's not a realistic accusation. And it's proven to be untrue. Just flip over a few pages to chapter 19. So when David makes his way back home, in chapter 19 and verse 24, we, we run into Mephibosheth again. It says, And Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king. He had neither taken care of his feet, nor trimmed his beard, nor washed his clothes, from the day the king departed until the day he came back in safety. Mephibosheth grieved. He mourned David's exile. And when he came to Jerusalem to meet the king, the king said to him, why did you not go with me, Mephibosheth? Because he's got Ziba's words ringing in his ear. He answered, my Lord, O king, my servant deceived me. For your servant said to him, I will saddle a donkey for myself that I may ride on it and go with the king. Mephibosheth can't saddle a donkey himself. He's lame. But he's just like, I got to go with David. But Ziba deceived him. He has slandered your servant to my Lord, the king. But my Lord, the king is like the angel of God. Do therefore what seems good to you. So what's really happening here? Ziba had followed the life of David 
basically his whole life. He had seen David chased by Saul just around a mountain, you know, just about to be caught only to escape from that. He had seen just incredible things from David. I think Ziba had learned over the course of decades just never to underestimate, uh, underestimate this man. This might look like the end, but don't under, underestimate this man. So well, how can I get the most out of this? Well, if I bring him some food supplies, he's going to think I'm a great guy. And if and when he comes back into his kingdom, he will reward me greatly. But if he loses, if Absalom ends up being in charge here, well, I didn't go with David. I've really got nothing to lose one way or the other. And so I'm going to play the odds and uh, see if I can win here. I think that's ultimately what's happening. Now look again at verse 4. Now David doesn't know any of that yet. All he knows is Ziba came with loads of supplies and Mephibosheth didn't. Look at verse 4. Then the king said to Ziba, Behold, all that belongs to Mephibosheth is now yours. And Ziba said, I pay homage. Let me ever find favor in your sight, my lord, the king. And so for Ziba, it worked. <laughs> he got everything he wanted. I think the question that we're faced with is how are we to think of David at this juncture? From the safety of an air-conditioned room in 2024, where there is no threat of immediate death or anything like that, where most of us are probably thinking about what we're going to have for lunch, it's easy as armchair quarterbacks to sit back and say, well, if it was me, boy, that seemed like a snap decision for David to make. I mean, how could he do that? Clearly, he, clearly Zeba was lying to him. And that's, that's an easy decision to make right here right now in the comfort of an air-conditioned room with our church family together. But remember, the, the job of Bible study is to try to get back into the sandals of the author, to the sandals of the people that to which this was happening to. And I just wonder if it was you or I on the run, a mile or two away from a tremendous army, Later, tomorrow or next week, we'll learn it's at least 12,000 strong. All of them intent on, on killing me. And somebody comes with food supplies that I need and tells me a story. Now, I wonder how prone we would be to believe his story. I think there's an important lesson for leaders here. This might just be the season of life that I'm in right now. But if you're in leadership or if you're under leadership, I think this might be helpful to you. If you're in leadership, I think it's helpful. I think this story is an illustration of the fact that sometimes leaders have to make the best decision that they can with the information that they have at the time, Just trusting that the Lord will sort it out in the end. That's true in church leadership. That's true in leadership in the world as well. Sometimes leaders have to make the best decision they can with the information that they have at the time. And so if you are a leader of some sort, can I just encourage you to just do the best you can and realize sometimes things don't work out. Do the best that you can. If you're under leadership, which all of us are under leadership of you know, one sort or another, I think this story might be a good reminder to us to um, maybe give a little bit of space to some of our leaders. It's a much harder job than you would think. And David, I think, is a great illustration of that fact. So the first enemy David meets, again, the story is about David in the presence of his enemies. The first enemy David meets is Ziba. Ziba has come to take, to get what he can. Second enemy David meets is Shimei. Shimei is the one who has come to curse. We read about Shimei in verse 5. When David came to Baharim, there came out a man of the family of the house of Saul. There's another Saul person whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera, 
And as he came, he cursed continually. We know more or less where this happened. Again, here's the Mount of Olives. David has crested the Mount of Olives. He's met Ziba, so he's got the donkeys. He's got the food supplies. And he's just, he's basically just going northeast. He, he's just trying to get away. That's, that's everything that's on his mind. And he comes to, this is probably the best guess that we have on where the city of Baharim is. They're kind of looking at it from the opposite direction, over the Mount of Olives, down to the city of Baharim. And there is Shimei, cursing continually. And he threw stones at David and all the servants of King David and all the people and all the mighty men who were on his right hand and on his left. So David is more or less surrounded by his mighty men as Shimei is, so it seems like he's walking on a, a ledge, maybe just a little bit higher than them, kind of out of reach, but still close enough. And he's just throwing stones and cursing. Later, it says that he will dirt them with dirt, just hurling dust and dirt upon them, cursing as he goes. And Shimei said as he cursed, get out, get out, you man of blood, you worthless man. Yahweh has avenged on you all the blood of the house of Saul. Don't miss that. All the house of the blood of Saul in whose place you have reigned and Yahweh has given you the kingdom into the hand of your son Absalom. See your evil is on you for you are a man of blood. Get out, get out you man of blood. Two accusations that he makes against David in his cursing. Number one, you are a man of blood. Number two, you are uh, a worthless fellow or the Hebrew actually says a son of Belial, the son of the devil, basically. You're a worthless human being. Now, we have a tremendous advantage here. We have been following the story of First and Second Samuel for a couple of years now. And so we know, having read all of this already, that that's not true. We know, because we followed the story, we know that David did everything he could to protect Saul. And that when people came to deliver the news about Saul's death to begin with, David had them killed. When people came, or when uh, Abner came and was murdered, David did everything that he could to make it clear that he had nothing to do that. When Ithbosheth was murdered in the north, David made it absolutely clear he had absolutely nothing to do with that. So we know that these curses, that Shimei's assumptions here are all just a pack of lies, that none of it is true. And yet that's what Shimei really believed in his heart of hearts. Shimei thought that he had insider knowledge that, that he really knew how things went down. That it's way, it's way too convenient for David, for Saul to die, and then for Abner to die, and then for Ishbosheth to die. He, he, had, he had looked at the conspiracy and he put all the pieces together. It all made sense to him. And now is his moment to come out with the truth. He, he posted it on Twitter. He wrote posts on Facebook. He called the evening news and he said, this man's a man of blood. He is a worthless fellow. And this just goes on and on as he follows them in their flight from Absalom. And eventually, Abishai, of course it's Abishai, has an idea. Verse 9, Then Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, said to the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over and take off his head. Abishai says, yeah, I've had about enough of all of this. And I have observed something over the years that when someone has been decapitated, they tend to shut up rather quickly. <laughs> and I would really like him to shut up. And so could I, could I just go cut off his head? I love it. I mean, that's just, this is Abishai. This is Joab, the sons of Zeruiah. They're like, this is their character. Verse 10. But the king said, and boy, you're really starting to see David's brokenness here. What have I to do with you, you sons of Zeruiah? If he is cursing because Yahweh has said to him, curse David, who then shall say, why have you done so? It's an interesting response to a terrible pressing situation. 
you can't help but notice the restraint of David because he could have done that easily. But I think by this point in David's life, he was a truly broken man. David knew that Shimei's accusations were not true in relation to the house of Saul. David had been nothing kind, nothing but kind and generous to the house of Saul. So he knew that what Shimei accused him of was not true in relation to the house of Saul. But David also knew that while Shimei was wrong, he was actually right. Because David was a man of blood. He had murdered Uriah in cold blood. And David had acted like a son of Belial, like a worthless fellow, in what he did to Bathsheba. And so he tells the sons of Zeruiah, He's, he's right. The Lord has told him to curse because I was that wrong. Again, I think, there's, I think there's a message here for those of us who are in leadership. Leaders endure tremendous amounts of criticism. This just goes with the territory. And it can be easy under that kind of criticism to just kind of get hard-hearted, cold-hearted, and say, no, I'm not going to listen. And yet, I think this is an illustration of the fact that while our critics are often wrong, there is still usually something for us to learn from them. When you are in leadership, your critics will often be wrong, but there is still something that you can learn from them. And if you try, you'll usually be benefited by their criticisms. For those of us who are under leadership, which again is all of us in one way or another, boy, we should not miss the fact that Shimei is a fool. He is a fool. And something that I say frequently to us as a congregation is the fact that time and truth go together. Given enough time, the truth will come out. And the truth does come out in fairly short order in the book of 2 Samuel. And eventually in the book of 1 Kings, David more or less has Shimei put to death for these curses. And that is a reminder to each of us that we will be held accountable for every word that we speak. That should probably get our attention in an election year when we have a lot lot of People have a lot to say about leaders or potential leaders. Friends, there is an accountability for every word that you speak, that you write, that you imply. We don't want to be shimmy We would be much better off acting like David in his restraint, in his wisdom here. Now look at the rest of his reasoning in verse 11. And David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, my my own son seeks my life. Have Have you forgotten why we left? My own son seeks my life. How much more now may this Benjamite leave him alone and let him curse for Yahweh has told him to curse. David, he he had just resigned himself to the chastisement, to the discipline of Yahweh. He realized that Shimei was an instrument in Yahweh's hand disciplining him for his sin. 
The author of Hebrews says it like this in Hebrews chapter 12. Beside this, he says, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful. Boy, this is painful for David, right? For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. David, he, he he surrenders, he yields to the discipline of the Lord, realizing that this is right because of what I've done. Now, verse 12 is interesting because you find um, something called a textual variant in verse 12. The Hebrew text of First and Second Samuel is famously difficult. There can be some real challenges in it. This is an example of that. In verse 12, it says, it may be, now the ESV translates it like this, it may be that Yahweh will look on the wrong done to me. Or basically what the ESV is saying is it, David's hope is that Yahweh will see his suffering, see his affliction, and then have compassion. That's how the ESV takes it. Yahweh will look at the suffering that I'm enduring right now and have compassion on me. That is, and that's one way you could take it. Another way you could take it, is perhaps Yahweh would look on my tears. That's that's the textual variant there, and it's challenging. But maybe Yahweh will see my tears and how much this hurts, and as a result of that, then he will have compassion. That's that's another way that you could take this. But I think the best reading of the text would go like this. It may be that Yahweh will look on, on my iniquity. That's that's a little harder, right? I can understand Yahweh seeing my suffering and having compassion. And that's that's why this is probably the best reading because it's the most awkward. It may be that Yahweh will look on my iniquity, that he will remember all the wrong that I did and that he will repay me with good for his cursing today. David knew that he was reaping what he had sown. He took another man's wife. He murdered her husband. He was a terrible father, refusing to stand up for his daughter or deal with his worthless son. He knew how wrong he was, but but David also knew his God. He knew, and he, and he he at least wondered if perhaps, despite all of that, all of the iniquity that he had done, all of his transgressions, he, he knew Yahweh, and he wondered perhaps God might look at all the wrong he had done and still choose to be kind. I wouldn't be kind under those circumstances, and I'll bet not, none of you would either. But Yahweh is not like us. And David knows, he knows, wouldn't, wouldn't that be just like him? Wouldn't it be just like Yahweh to look on my admitted guilt and to still forgive, to still choose to do good for him? Wouldn't that be just like him? Because Yahweh is the kind of God who almost can't help himself. He is so full of compassion. His heart is so inclined towards his children. He is the kind of God who is so overflowing with mercy and grace. He is the kind of God who is so full of love that he almost can't help himself. It's it's almost as if he must shower that love and grace (coughs) upon his people. Oh, friends, Hear this, and especially if you have sinned greatly in the past. So many Christians live their lives like secondhand citizens, just imprisoned to what they've done before, thinking that God begrudgingly lets them into the kingdom. Friends, if that's you, please hear this. You, you simply cannot imagine 
How deep and warm and wide is God's compassion for you, even when he is disciplining you, just as he is disciplining David. You have, you have no idea how much he loves you, even in the midst of your afflictions. David had a sense of that. And see, how, so he says, perhaps, even though I, <laughs> I have done so wrong, perhaps he will look on my iniquity and somehow still find it in himself to show compassion. Because that's the kind of God that he is. Now, the story of Shimei wraps up in verses 13 and 14. So David and his men went on the road while Shimei went along on the hillside opposite him and cursed as he went and threw stones at him and flung dust. That's the Hebrew, the dirty, <coughs> dirtying him with dirt. And the king and all the people who were with him arrived weary at the Jordan. And there he refreshed himself. It's a 27 mile walk descending some 3,700 feet from where David was to where he was going. Here's from Baharim. And he just keeps making his way down the ascent of Adamim. This is the long trek, 27 miles, 3,700 feet. Ultimately, it seems best to understand that he ends up in Jericho, or at least in the Jericho region. And it says that here he refreshed himself. So this is the story of David in the presence of his enemies. Verses 1 through 4, he meets up with Ziba. Ziba is the one who has come to take. Verses 5 through 14, he meets up with Shimei. Shimei is the one who has come to curse. And we're going to skip forward to verse 20, where he meets Ahithophel. And Ahithophel is the one who has come to destroy. So we're doing something of a flashback when we come to verse 20. David had crested the Mount of Olives just as Absalom and Ahithophel and their forces came into Jerusalem. We've kind of followed David. He meets up with Ziba. He meets up with um, Shimei, he gets all the way down to the Jordan. Now we're going back in time to what happens in Jerusalem as Absalom and Ahithophel come in. Verse 20. Then Absalom said to Ahithophel, give your counsel. What shall we do? Again, just a reminder of where all this happened. Absalom launches from Hebron in the south, marches north to Jerusalem. That's where these verses take place as David is making his way northeast, just now arriving in Jericho. This is the city of David, and that's David's palace. That, that's where he lived. That's where this happened, right, right there. Now, before we hear Ahithophel's advice, we need to be reminded, who, who was Ahithophel? We kind of just met him not too long ago. In 2 Samuel 11, the story of David and Bathsheba. David asks who Bathsheba is. This is before the affair. And the answer is, is not this Bathsheba the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So what we learn in 2 Samuel 11 is that Bathsheba is the daughter of Eliam. Eliam is her father. Later in 2 Samuel, in chapter 23, we have a, a list of David's mighty men and their relationship with one another. And in chapter 23, verse 34, we read this. Eliam was the son of Ahithophel, the Gilonite. And so when you take all the information we have and put it together about Ahithophel, what we learn is this. Bathsheba was Eliam's daughter, and Ahithophel's granddaughter. And you know, fathers love their daughters. I mean, wow, it, it is something unique. And I haven't had this experience yet, but I've been told that grandfathers really love their granddaughters. 
And think about what David did to Ahithophel's granddaughter. I think that man never forgot and was looking for whatever opportunity he could take to destroy him for what he did to his little girl. And now is his moment. Ahithophel was a major part of the court. In verse 23, we read that his word, when he gave counsel, it was as if you were consulting the word of God himself. He he was that well regarded. And so I think it's entirely plausible that Ahithophel was fully aware of what Nathan had prophesied to David in chapter 12. Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. And he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. And knowing all of that, listen to Ahithophel's counsel in verses 21 and 22. Ahithophel said to Absalom, Go into your father's concubines, whom he has left to keep the house. And all Israel will hear that you have made yourself a stench to your father. And the hands of all who are with you will be strengthened. So they pitched a tent for Absalom on the roof, on on that roof, the very roof that David was walking on when he saw Bathsheba. They pitched a tent for Absalom on the roof, and Absalom went into his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. It's unspeakably wicked. It's almost the kind of verse you hesitate to preach on and You know, church, it's so gross. Culturally, what's happening here is the transfer of the harem. To be a king in the ancient Middle East was to have a a harem, a collection of concubines. And when a new king came to power, he would take over that harem. And that's what Absalom is doing here. Then you read verse 23. Now in those days... The counsel that Ahithophel gave was as if one consulted the word of God. So was all the counsel of Ahithophel esteemed both by David and by Absalom. The the cumulative effect of everything that we just read, all 23 verses, when you get to the end of the chapter, it feels as if there is no hope for David. He is surrounded by enemies, and Ahithophel is out to destroy him for good reason. And Ahithophel's counsel is like the word of God. I mean, the, the, the end of this chapter just makes you abandon all hope, ye who enter here. Just, there's, there's just nothing left. He is surrounded by enemies that are intent on taking from him, on cursing him, and on destroying him. But back in verse 15, there is one faint, almost imperceptible ray of hope. If you remember, I know this is a few months ago, but as David left Jerusalem, he came across his friend Hushai. And he asked Hushai, if he would be willing to be a double agent, to go back to the city, to do what he could to undermine Ahithophel and to send word to David about Absalom's plans. Well, verse 15, we see Ahithophel. Now Absalom and all the people, the men of Israel came to Jerusalem and Ahithophel with them. And when Hushai the archite, David's friend, came to Absalom, Hushai said to Absalom, long live the king, long live the king. You do have to wonder, like, which king is he talking about? Absalom assumes it's him. Absalom said to Hushai, is this your loyalty to your friend? Why did you not go with your friend? 
And Hushai said to Absalom, No, for whom Yahweh and his people and all the men of Israel have chosen, his will I be, and with him I will remain. And again, whom should I serve? Should it not be his sons, as I have served your father, so I will serve you. Now, the text doesn't give any indication as to whether Absalom believed him or not. It just moves on to the story of Ahithophel. Like I said, it's, it's a slight ray of hope. It's, it's barely perceptible. It's, it's not much. It's, it's just one man. It's just one faint hope. It's, it's just one ray of light. But as we'll see in the chapters to come, God delights in using the faintest of hopes, the smallest rays of light, to absolutely turn the world upside down. Many years later, in the fullness of time, a faint light came into this world. A son of David was born just outside of Jerusalem in a little town called Bethlehem. And very few people even noticed the coming of this light. But I love how the Apostle John describes his birth. First in John 1, 4, and 5, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. This is a dark chapter. David is in the presence of his enemies. But there is light shining in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Let's pray. Father, this is a a remarkable passage of Scripture, and God, we are just so thankful. We're thankful for these kinds of stories. They they can be hard stories to be sure, but they, they are beautiful and helpful to us in our daily lives. So we rejoice in that. Father, I I pray for each of us, Lord. Some of us are going through dark, dark times right now. And I pray that you would just remind us that the light is still there, that the darkness has not overcome it, that you are a God rich in compassion and love. And if we will turn to you, if we will call out to Jesus, that he will save us, he will help us, and he will give us hope for the future. We pray all these things in his name. Amen.